Hmm. All right, so this is part two of the Christian and reading. This will be really interesting if I can't get my notes to open. We could still get through it. Give me a quick second. So last time we uh, talked introduction to the Christian in reading and talked about the importance of being purposeful in our reading. Uh, I just wanted to jump right in, continue our pastoral discussion of what ought to be on our hearts and minds as we pursue reading, as we pursue reading as Christians to honor the Lord. Part two, or the, the second encouragement that I have after being purposeful is to be humble. This is critical and it's not always the first mark that somebody would think of when they think of readers. They might, sorry, I feel like I have a bad echo. You might think of readers as the learned, as the ones who know everything and want to make sure that you know that they know everything. But Think about what you are doing when you're saying, I need to read a book. I need to set my heart before, or I need to set my heart, my mind before this book and learn something that I didn't know before. Just in that very act, you're declaring, there's things I don't know. And you're saying, and I need somebody who does know to explain it to me. That, so make an effort to read your superiors and then to recognize them as such, right? We said, be, as you're being purposeful in what you're reading, seek to read things that you don't know about as an expression of humility. And when you're reading things that you do know about, you still ought to be learning from a, a place of humility. When you sit down at the foot of a teacher to learn, you're recognizing that you are deficient in some way and needy and that the teacher has something to offer you. Sometimes you might be opening up a book that you know nothing about the topic. You're gonna be purposeful in the way that you read that book. And it's probably easy to be humble in, sorry, in that regard. Sometimes you read books that you know a lot about, you're still gonna be I encourage you to consciously take an expression of humility as you read. You can walk away proud of your new knowledge, wanting to be a teacher before you've taught yourself. And so reading, knowing I need to both know the knowledge in here and then to be changed by it, That is a, I'd say, a necessary mark of the Christian when you read, and something that that ought to set you apart from the non-believing world uh, as you read. One of the difficulties in reading is that you're regularly reading things that you don't understand and that you don't know, right? At least you should. And sometimes when you didn't know something before, it's something that maybe the people you hang out with also didn't know. Now you labor really hard. You know about that topic, even enough to be a teacher in some regards. And it's easy without heart shepherding to find yourself, hey, now I know, why don't you know? And rather than an expression of love and patience, uh, because you were, before you read, maybe just in the same spot as they were, it's easy to become puffed up and proud. Should I switch to this other mic? It, is it just me? Or I'm, I'm hearing a pretty bad echo. Hmm? Switch to this guy. How's that? Thanks. I was distracting myself. So, let me pop that out.
And so it, if you think of how knowledge is supposed to be used, have you ever thought through, why do I want to know things? Why ought you to, at least one, what is one of the purposes that the Bible was written? What's one of the purposes you set your heart before God's word? Or I'd say even the way that Paul put his, one of his intentions in writing to Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. One of the reasons you ought to pursue knowledge is to love better, to be humble, to be holy. I'd, I'd summarize it as the reason that you read, the reason that I read, if I'm going to preach the truth for myself, why am I doing this? It's so that I can know what is true for the purpose of godly living, of worshipful godly living and love. I want to know what is true. Reading, whether it's the Bible or other books, sometimes they don't have what is true, and you can use that as a means to actually discern it, but I want to know what is true as a means to pursue worshipful godliness and love, love for both God and, and my neighbor. But it is so easy to let knowledge puff up rather than love. You know, that's, that's what was going on in, in Corinth. That's the admonishment in, in 1 Corinthians 8. If, if through your knowledge you destroy a brother, that's the exact opposite of the effect that that knowledge should have in you. So a better alternative is gratefulness and humility leading to repentance of sin and worship of God, and then serving and building up others in light of your knowledge. So pursue books and authors that help you to learn like this. Regularly evaluate the effects of the practices that you have in your life, especially your reading, on your humility, your love, your worshipful stance before God. Knowledge in the wrong hands is dangerous. That's why we call the trust, right? We have build and wellspring. And then the second layer of leadership training in, in this church is called the trust. Because what you have learned, Paul says, what you have learned in the pre from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. One of the mark of a faithful man who's going to be able to handle knowledge well will be humility, worshipfulness, and love. So beware when you want others to see the book you're reading. Look at me, I'm reading this thousand book char or this thousand page Charnock book. You probably don't even understand what it what it says, but I do. Like that you never say that out loud, but I've seen that culture, especially in young men. I've seen that tendency in me, and it's fatal. Put it to death and rather pursue love through knowledge as you read. Read because you need it, because you don't know, because you need to be taught. Read to know God. Read to get the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's. If you're reading and you're thinking about others more than you're thinking about yourself, oh man, this guy really needs to know this, it's probably evidence, whether it's the Bible or other books, it's probably evidence that you're not reading how you ought. Read with a humility. Read with an end towards love. If you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Thessalonians 4, 5. I want you to see this. I'm going to give you the punchline so you see it coming. At the end of verse 5, it says, there's something that's going to set you apart from those who do not know God. 
One of the reasons why you read is so that you know what is true and you know the source of truth. You ought to, in your reading, seek to know God and make sure that your reading is aiming at this kind of knowledge. Now, Paul says to the Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality and that you know how to control your body and that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not like those who don't know God. That knowledge ought to direct, ought to lead you to holiness. There's a way to know all about God. There's a way to know God like demons know God. Unaffected or know God in a way that is a hearer of the word but not a doer. One that puffs up and says, now I'm better off because I know something. But you don't actually know it how you ought because it hasn't affected the way that you live. It hasn't affected the way that you love. And it hasn't affected your worship. That's why in humility, as you read the Bible or any other book, guard yourself from being puffed up and thinking that you've accomplished something because you got that knowledge into your head or your word or your eyes skimmed across the page but say i need to aim that through knowledge of what's real or knowledge of the truth right so you have to do all the hard work to actually say what is this author saying is it true but don't stop there push all the way through to the, how must this affect me? And it ought to affect you through worshipful, um, humble love. Also reference, I won't go there, Titus 1.16, there's those who profess to know God but deny them by their works. James 1.22, tendency of risk of being a hearer only, who sees what's true and forgets and deceives yourself. As you read, whether it's the Bible or other books, recognize your dependence and pray. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.7, he commands Timothy to think over what I say. Do the hard work of thinking, for the Lord will give you understanding. When you read, you, you ought to be ready to do the hard work of thinking. Some books you're thinking less, and that's, you're being purposeful in that. You're saying, okay, this is a book that I can sit back and, and receive. I'm not going to, I don't need to think quite as deeply. This, is, this isn't a hard work kind of book. And there's other books where you purposefully are saying, I, I'm going to need to do some really hard work. I'm going to need to stretch that muscle of my mind here. But don't ever do that independence thinking Oh man, I, I've really trained my mind to think well, so I'm safe. I'm a, I'm a deep thinker. I'm a good thinker. I'm a discerning thinker. And think that you're not dependent on the Lord for understanding. I, I love what, what Piper says in his book, Reading the Bible Supernaturally. Speaking of, of reading God's word, and I'd say this applies to all knowledge, but especially knowledge of God's word, which comes to us in a book. He says, true understanding of the apostolic word is a free gift of God. We do not find it on our own. It is given. That's why we pray, give me understanding. That's why you ought to know something is really wrong. Just like fingers on a chalkboard. When you open up God's word and you start reading and you haven't prayed and you're not praying, just don't let that happen. But don't, don't let that happen when you're reading other books too, whether it's anatomy and physiology textbook or systematic theology or anything in between. God, give me understanding. Piper continues, it's also the fruit of thinking. Understanding isn't only a gift of God, but it's the fruit of thinking, indeed rigorous 
thinking. So as we talk about the necessity of prayer in the process of reading, don't slip into thinking that this creates a shortcut around the natural act of wrestling with words and phrases and clauses. The natural act of reading. And you see how this is an expression of humility. I don't have in my mind what it takes to understand this rightly. Even if I can discern the meaning of the text, my wicked heart will apply this wrongly. My wicked heart will puff itself up. My heart might know the truth here, but won't be able to apply it as I ought. Benjamin Warfield, the great Princeton professor of theology, he, this is continuing from that same book, a quote, was rebuked by an unsympathetic saint of his day for Warfield's emph emphasis on study. That student said, 10 minutes on your knees will give you a truer knowledge of God than 10 hours over your books. And Warfield's response captured the biblical marriage of thinking and praying when he said, what more than 10 hours over your books on your knees? He would not accept the implied either or, and neither should we. So as we read, pray and study, study and pray. That applies to your reading of the Bible. And, and honestly, that applies to your reading of, of other books. You're going to be purposeful. Books are going to be read differently with different levels of this. But you ought never divorce a prayerful humility that's pursuing that worshipful, humble love of others and love of God as you pray, no matter what the topic. Be humble as you read. One more, if you could turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians one twenty, I want you to see this, and this ought to humble us even further and make us pursue humility as we read. In the wisdom of God. This isn't a bug in the system. This isn't an unfortunate byproduct of the way the gospel was. This is the way God made the gospel. In God's wisdom, he made it so that the world would not know God through wisdom. Let's read 120 through 25. Where is the the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the, this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly, the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness, folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. And that's why Paul chapter two says that when he came, he, he didn't come with lofty speech and wisdom, but with... Uh, but he came in weakness, fear, trembling, and his speech and message were not in words of wisdom primarily. That wasn't where the power was to be had, but in demonstrations of spirit and power so that your faith not, might not rest in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. So why do I bring that up here? Because you could be the smartest, most well-read person with all the knowledge of the world in front of you. And if you rely on that knowledge, on that wisdom, on worldly wisdom, and don't have the grace of God to actually open the eyes of your heart to that which the world and its wisdom sees as foolishness, that wisdom, all of that knowledge will be worse than worthless to you because you will not be saved. God in his wisdom made the message of the cross one that the world would reject as foolish and you must embrace as the wisdom of God. So that doesn't mean you ignore wisdom, you ignore learning. You say, oh, that's not important. No, but you pursue it with a God-tuned humility 
to say, God, let me see your wisdom, your truth in this. Let me read informed through the, the lens of scripture so that I'm not captured. I'm not pulled away by what the world views as wise. But God, what you do in your wisdom. So in your reading, aim at worshipful godliness manifested through love via knowledge of what is true. If you understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, but you don't have love, you're nothing. If your, your knowledge is worse than worse, worthless, if you use it to t- tear a brother down, if you know all the truths in the world and you can't know how to control your body, you're no better off than those who don't know God. So don't pit knowledge against love. Don't pit knowledge against godliness. But in humility, know that the means of godliness and the means of love is knowledge rightly received. And we have such a wealth of knowledge in God's word and in books that help us understand God and his word revealed better. And and the God who, who that word reveals. So each time you sit down pray. And as you pray, remind yourself explicitly of the aim of your reading. This is, as you read God's word, know what you're aiming at. As you read other things, know what you're aiming at, and you're more likely to hit it. Independence on God asking his help to accomplish this love and godliness through knowledge as you read. Be humble. Next, be consistent. The man who does not read has no advantage over the man who cannot read, said Mark Twain. You don't need to read a ton, right? The best way to get started is to start. Um, one of the, the classic illustrations, sorry for so much Piper, he, he's well read. He's really one of my mentors through reading. And so I'm, I'm going to do another Piper quote on reading. Um, but it's, I, I'm a slow reader. And you're, you're going to probably see as I talk about interacting why I am. I have, it takes me an hour to get through five pages sometimes. You might say, well, how have you read so much? And I, I haven't, I'm not the most read, most well-read guy in this room, I'm sure. But how, how have I read a lot? Well, for 23 years of being saved, just read a little bit every day. And over 23 years, that turns into a lot of reading. And I, I look around at guys whose heads are going up and down. I'm like, yep, you've read more books than me. You have more time and, and maybe you read better. But, but there's a, like I said earlier, there's, most of the men, most of the people the godliest people who you'd want to become like are, are readers. And not because they always read 10 hours a day, like that Warfield quote says. Sometimes it's just because they read 15 minutes every day. So I'll read this, this Piper quote that I know has become famous, but it's also really encouraging. It's from his book, When I Don't Desire God, How to Fight for Joy. A great one. He says, suppose you read slowly like I do. Maybe about the same speed that you speak, 200 words a minute. And if you read 15 minutes a day for one year, say just before supper or just before bed, you will read 5,475 minutes in the year. Multiply that by 200 words a minute and you get 1,095,000 words that you will have read in a year. Now, the average serious book might have about 360 pages, so you would have read 3,041 pages in one year. That's 10 very substantial books, all in 15 minutes a day. Or to be specific, my copy of Calvin's Institutes has 1,521 pages in two volumes, with an average of 400 words per page. So that means that even, and it goes through the number of words, that means even if you took a day off each week, you could read this great biblical vision of God and man in less than nine months at 15 minutes a day. The point is the words and ways of God will abide in you more deeply and more powerfully 
if you give yourself to some serious reading of the great books that are saturated with scripture. It certainly doesn't have to be John Calvin or my favorite Jonathan Edwards, but not to read any of the great old books when you have access to them. Maybe owing to nothing better than what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. And I'd add, sometimes you can be overwhelmed by a big book or the thought process or the the number of books that you haven't read and think, I need to get through them all at once. You can't. You won't even get through all of them in your whole life. But that's not the point. It's not to get through all of the books, but to get a few select, really helpful ones into you. Don't get through them. Get them into you. We often don't take advantage of 15-minute blocks of time. Think of how many times in your day. It's really hard to get an hour, but think of what you do when you have 5, 10, 15 minutes. It's really easy to waste them. Pursuing the dopamine hit of social media scrolling or games. Reading an article, a news article, that it's more titillating than it was edifying. Sometimes just passive consumption, how easy it is to blow 30 minutes on TV episode, Netflix, mindless daydreaming. I mean, I, even as I'm saying this, I, I know I, there's so much opportunity to excel still more. And that doesn't mean that you have to fill. I don't want you to feel a burden. Oh, I need to fill all of my free time with reading. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. There, there are many, many good things. And all of the gifts of God, including leisure, are just good gifts to enjoy. But if you find yourself not reading, it might be that you have started to see, this is going to be one of my last points, read it uh, as something to be enjoyed, um, read delightfully. But it might be that, that you just aren't in the practice of filling your free time with edifying, helpful things. Some of that might just be the the benefit of reading a good book. I want to get through this good, entertaining book, this good, delightful book. Oh, good! I have five minutes. I'm going to read it. Ten minutes. Now you're you're practicing. You're you're building that that muscle of your brain, that reading muscle, and you're practicing and you're making a practice of. Oh, I have time. Maybe I should read something that might not have crossed your mind. And then if you find fifteen, thirty minutes of time when you're not distracted, when you're saying, I'm actually going to purposefully set this block of time. I'm not going to wait and see if I have a gap. But this is important enough to me that I'm going to put it on my calendar. Or my, I'm going to wake up 30 minutes earlier. Or I'm going to make sure I have 30 minutes before bed. Or fill in the blank kind of time. I don't know when it is for you. But you block that time out. 15, 30 minutes. Over the course of a year, you're going to get through 10, 20, pretty substantial books. And it's one of those things where it's, it has some momentum to it, in my experience. When you're reading and you're delighting in it and you're seeing benefit, it's easier to find time. It's just like if you've ever tried to start an exercise program. You're like, man, it, it doesn't work if it fits in the margins. And it's really hard to get started. But once you make a pattern of it, it's sort of hard to stop. But then you find when you stop and you fall out of the pattern for a while, it's hard to get back into it. Reading just like every discipline is like that. So just put it on your schedule, make a pattern and make sure and and don't fall into the, the thought that you need to do it all at once. Just be consistent. I'd say one of the, the most helpful things in consistency is a reading plan. I I said it last time, that's why we on our book of the month, that's why we say to make it not overwhelming every, every month on the book of the month, there's a reading plan that says how many pages you need to read a day to finish it in a month. That's not because we ran out of room on the paper to, to, we had to fill it with something. That's, That's because it's, it's actually encouraging and helpful to say, I can't read this book all in one day. I can't even read it in one week probably effectively. Maybe you can. There's lots of people who can. I'm not a fast reader, but I can do it in a month, just a little bit every day. 
I tend to like to, when I'm reading multiple books at once, be consistent not only in my reading, but consistent where I read. There's, for something in my brain, especially if I'm reading a few different things, and I talked about why last time, why I like to read in different types of books. Not only do I like to be consistent in reading every day, but consistent in where I read what I read. Take it or leave it, that's, maybe I'm weird like that, but when I read a book, it's that book in that chair. And I, I don't read a different book in that chair. I even, my kids might, I don't know if you've seen that, Ellie. I, I actually change spots on the couch when I read different books. It's weird, but it helps my brain. Um, it's, anyway, it's take it or leave, be consistent. There's a, a benefit for me in consistency of what device I'm reading a book on, where I'm physically reading it and what I'm doing. I didn't know where else to put that, so I stuck it here. That may, may only be helpful to me um, but it, it is actually helpful to me to help my mind get in that spot. Albert Moeller wrote in his book, Convictions to Lead, he has a whole chapter, I think I referenced it last time on reading. He said, there will never be enough time to read all that you want to read or even all that you think you ought to read. Just keep reading. Set aside segments of time devoted to reading and grab every spare minute you can find. Keep reading materials with you at all times, or at least close at hand. That is so easy in this digital age. And even not digitally, it's pretty easy to put a book in your bag, back pocket, leave it on your glove box. Leave it in your glove box or on your car seat. He says, I often find that travel, though robbing me of time in other respects, gives me segments of time to read. Some books can be read in a flight segment or two. You will know your best reading style. So foster habits that will maximize your reading and its value. I could keep going on that, but I will move on to the next point, which I would say is be active. All right, so we've had be purposeful, be humble, be consistent, and be active as you read. Different books will require different levels of activity. Back to that first point, be purposeful in which one you choose for which book. But don't just stop at information and don't think that getting the information on the page into your eye is the end of reading. Especially if it's a book that you sit down and you're like, I really need to know. I need to be mastered by the content of this book. I, I'm reading this not for entertainment not just to familiarize myself with a topic, but because I, I wanna know this. I, I need to be able to teach it. And remember when you say, I need to be able to teach it, who do you need to teach it to first? Yourself, right? If, if, you, if you're saying, man, I, I, I need to be able to teach this to my small group, or I need to be able to teach this to my friend I'm counseling, you better have taught it to yourself first, right? You, you, um, if we're restoring someone, Galatians 6.1, you do it in a spirit of gentleness, looking to your own self first, so that you're not likewise tempted. Jesus, why as I referenced it, you get the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brothers. When we are teaching, we're pursuing humility and love, like I said, and as we're learning something to master it, make sure you're teaching it to your own self. And this might not be theological. This might be, man, I need to... Teach, if you're a teacher in school, you're learning my favorite topic, uh, talk about anatomy and physiology, right? You, as you learn that, I need, to, I need to not only master the subject matter, but I need to master the heart I want my students to learn it in. I need to understand first exactly what it says, discern is it true, and then practice having the heart of humility that worships God for creating the world like this. Practice that on yourself so that you can model that to your, to your teacher. So anyway, why am I saying this? Don't stop at information. Understand it, truly understand it, to apply it to yourself first. Yeah, I'll read this quote, it's a good one. From uh, Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book, I referenced it. Last week, I, I really recommend it. If you're like, man, I need to get better at reading. 
it's a good book if you actually actively read it and apply it to your reading to help you be a better reader. But he speaks of an abecedarian ignorance, one who just knows their ABCs, that precedes knowledge and a doctoral ignorance that comes after it. The first is an ignorance of those who not knowing their ABCs cannot read at all, right? So there's some people who are just ignorant because they can't read. We always tell our kids, I might have stole this from Sarah Demarest, learn to read when we're teaching our kids in school, learn to read so that they can read to learn. There's an ignorance of the ABCs that means you just don't even have the world of knowledge open to you. But now after you've learned, you can still be super ignorant. And that's what he's saying. The second is the ignorance of those who have misread many books. They are, as Alexander Pope rightly calls them, bookful blockheads, ignorantly read. There have always been literate ignoramuses who have read too widely and not well. The Greeks had a name for such a mixture of learning and folly, which might be applied to the bookish but poorly read of all ages, and that word is sophomore. Anyway, I, that's just, I love that quote in the whole paragraph, the whole chapter. But the, the point is, you can read a ton of books. Knowing how to read is just the start to getting knowledge. And we've talked about how to pursue knowledge rightly, not merely the, the reading, but the heart behind the reading. But now, how do you actually read and get that knowledge into your brain? One of the most important ways is to read actively with a desire to say, what what is this actually saying? You can't apply what you've read until you accurately understand it. You can't consider and argue and interact with what you've read until you accurately understand it. Uh, you can't even really be discerning, is this true or not, until you've actively understood it. And one of the best ways to actively understand what's written in a book is to be actively interacting with it. And that's why if you have a, a dead tree book, have a pen. If you have a digital book, use your keyboard, but be interacting and make the book your own. I love Tim Challies talks about this process. He says, you know, you've got, there might be 50 copies of the same book on the shelf. Okay, the book table or bookstore. And you're gonna take one of them. Now your job is to make that book your own so that this book will be different from all other books. How? Because I'm highlighting things that are important. I'm underlining the things that are important to me. I'm writing notes in the margins. I'm actively really engaging with this book. It's like you're sitting down face to face with the author, having a discussion. I'm writing questions. What do you mean by this? And then I'm actually looking for the answer. I want to, when I say, what do you mean? I'm, I'm hoping that the author actually explained it, and I'm looking for the answer. I'm hoping that later he's going to answer that question. I'm writing things in the margin. I'm doing everything I can to make sure I'm really engaged with that book. Piper said, again, another Piper quote, most of us are cursed with a penchant towards passive reading. We read the way people watch TV. We don't ask questions how we, as we read. And we don't ask, why does this sentence follow that sentence? How does this paragraph relate to that one three pages earlier? We don't ferret out the order of thought or ponder the meaning of terms. Now, asking such question is a matter of failing to read with an active mind. So. I'm just going to give a few hints. That book, How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler, that whole book is designed to help you read actively. It talks about the different types of reading, gives you really practical hints and helps and guides for how to do it. And it's just one way. The best way is just to know this is what you're aiming at and learn and, and develop your own style with the goal of, of truly understanding. But big picture, my, it, when you're reading to really understand, reading is a conversation. And if you're having a conversation, you have to listen. You have to make sure you hear the words that the other one's saying and hear them as they intended to be heard. There's an authorial intent. Don't just skim through and say, how does this affect me? Or something like that. Or do I like what's being said? How does this make me feel? But say, no, what, what's being said? Am I actually following the argument? If there's an argument being made, there's usually a point, 
then some evidence or some line of reasoning, and then another point, some line of reasoning, and then a conclusion. Can you state what that point is, what the conclusion is that you're supposed to come to, and if those arguments lead to the conclusion? Or do you just read passively as if well, he must be saying it, so it must be true, or it doesn't even matter what the arguments are, I'm just going to get to the, get to the meat, what's, what's the point? Think of it like a conversation. You're, you're drawing them out. You're listening. You're asking questions. Wait, does, does that point really lead to that conclusion? You, set, you gave that as evidence. Is that true? Uh, especially if somebody says, just like this Bible verse says, or references parenthetically a verse, flip. Make sure that that's actually what that verse says. Interact. Write notes in the margins. Write numbers. I do this... My logos, I have numbered highlights. You can make special highlights that have, have numbers, have logical things. And I actually, as I read a book digitally, I'm highlighting and saying argument one, argument two, argument three, conclusion. And note on that, yes, th these led to it. And I try to summarize one set. He has a paragraph, one sentence. Argument one is, argument two is, here's the conclusion. Is that valid? If you're really digging in, if you do that hard work, you'll probably understand what the author's saying at a better level than if you don't. And you'll be better able to discern, do I want to make this thinking my own? Or is this thinking I need to guard against? You can't do that without being active. More Moeller on this. He says, think of reading as a silent but intensive conversation. As you read... Ask the author questions. Filter the book's content through the fabric of your convictions. Argue with the book and its author when necessary. Agree and elaborate when appropriate. I love to say, oh yes, and, like you made a point, and I'm like, oh, and this and this and this and this follow. And then run through that argument in my own mind. Um, just to say, how does this bit of knowledge I just received fit in with my understanding of the world and my understanding of this topic? in a whole. Oh, this other author talked about it. Go grab that other book on your, off your, your shelf and write, see this author. Make cross-references in your books. Or digitally, I do that all the time. I'll go to one book, copy and paste the URL from the page. It's easy in Logos. Or you can say, see chapter two, and you, you put a note over in this other book so that if you ever reference it again, you know to go back. And now you're, you're getting this web of your thinking and your understanding of what's true. And you're not just fitting one author into it, but you're getting all of what you know cohesive and challenging your thinking, growing from it, and challenging the presuppositions and the conclusions of the author. Muller continues, he says, treat the book as a notepad with printed words. In other words, write in your books. Make the book your own by marking points of agreement and disagreement, highlighting particularly important sections of text, and underlining and diagramming where helpful. This applies to your Bible. This applies to your, your books. Unless the specific copy of your book has some historical or emotional value, mark it up with abandon. The activity of marking your books adds tremendously to the value of your reading and your retention of its contents. I can go back to a book I read half a century ago and re-enter my experience of reading that book for the first time. Adler writes on this in that book that I how to read a book. He says, if you ask a living teacher a question, he will probably answer you. And if you're puzzled by what he says, you can save yourself the trouble of thinking by just asking what he means. If, however, you ask a book a question, you must answer it yourself. But don't answer it yourself out of your own mind, but say, no, I want to understand the author. You say, what do you mean by this? Write that in the margin. What do you mean by this? And then try to answer your own question through what he said. Some authors might just either be poor writers, not answer the question you asked, or some are actually, actually trying to deceive you by making statements, making things that look like arguments that don't actually that support what they just said. The only way to find it, all that out is to interact and try to answer those questions. Anyway, Adler continues, 
He says, when you question it, it answers you only to the extent that you do the work of thinking and analysis yourself. Be active in your reading. Summar so, summarize a book. At the end of a chapter, go back to the top of the, if this is a book you really want to get into you, maybe as you're going. Some authors are nice. They put bullet points or subheadings that help you follow their argument. Some, some don't. Some of those bullet points are more publisher to help it look good than it is actually help you do the argument. Write in the margins, like I said, point one, point two, point three, or however it works for your own brain to help interact. And then at the end of the chapter, go back to the front, write a paragraph, write a sentence, maybe just write a word about what this chapter is about, but be able to explain it back. If you finished a chapter and you can't say what it was about or what, what it said, you're maybe being one of those bookful blockheads that hasn't read well. So, so do that work of summarizing. That extra, it doesn't take long, but it takes hard work. Right, you finish a chapter, you just spent an hour on this chapter. To take two minutes at the end to summarize it isn't that big of an investment relatively. But if you're like me, everything in your flesh is like, oh, that's too, too hard of work. Because it's really easy to be a passive recipient of knowledge, it's, it's harder to think hard and to interact, but that's actually the necessary part and, and where the benefit comes. So sometimes your summary, sometimes you won't be digging into detail. There's some books you may pick up and just say, I need to familiarize myself with this content. You're not even reading every word. You're skimming, you're looking at headings and then you're digging in, you're saying, yep, that's the part I need. And so you might just, be skimming through, slowing down, highlighting a page, now skimming through, highlighting a, a section or having a notebook and just, this is what this author says. You're just trying to familiarize yourself with, with an author and you're gonna skim through a whole book in half an hour. That's gonna be a different level of marking than that 15 minutes a day, I'm gonna get through a 300 page book in a month and a half. Be purposeful. But don't skip, no matter what you're doing, don't, don't skip the having the, the pencil or pen in your hand or keyboard on your computer, and most importantly, a mind that is active. And no matter what kind of book you're doing, you're, you're reading, um, mark the flow or do some kind of, some kind of work to, to track the flow of the argument. Sometimes that's, if it's a history book, front page, important dates, or this, then this, then this, or just you're reading about re remembering, reminding yourself in the flow of thought where this, or flow of time, where this event is, or if it's a theological book, understanding where in the argument an author is. This is so important with Puritans. They are very outlined in their thinking, and it's easy to get lost. You'll, you might be three points into an argument, and this especially John Owen, he'll take like five pages. And if you don't remember that this is a argument on a sub point of a sub point of the main point, you're going to be totally lost. You, you might be reading good things and say, oh, that's really well said, sir. But it's not the, you're missing, why, why is he saying that here? But if you keep in mind on an outline, a flow of thought, where you are in an argument and what's being said, it will serve you very well. Um, a great example of this, if you're like, Jake, what are you talking about on outlines? If you go get the, uh, there's two works, Owen's a great example, by um, John Owen and edited by Justin Taylor and Kelly Capick. I'm not sure if I said that name right. They've actually done the work of creating that outline and it's in the back of the book. Photocopy that and have it next to you as you read, it will help so much. And use that as a model of what you might be aiming at as you read other, especially highly logical, flowing authors say, I want to create my own analytical outline as I go so that I know where I am in my reading. Um, that might be in the margins, that might be on a separate piece of paper, might be on a, on a computer, whatever it is. Mark the flow. Ask questions, like I said, write those questions in the margins in the notebook. Make a code for your highlighting. It may be colors, I disagree with this, I need to question this, research this more, great quote, I love this. 
this needs to change me, make a code with colors or marks, stars, exclamations, whatever. Make a code, make it your own, be consistent. Don't be scared to change it if your code stinks. But just make it your own and, and use it. When you're done, like I said, take the, the hard work of going, when you read, finish a chapter, summarize it. When you finish a book, just a few minutes, maybe more if it's a book that really matters, go back through, what did it say? Is it true? And then that final question that I encourage you always to ask, same in, when you're reading God's word and when you're reading a book, I don't care what kind of book, is this true? Well, but God's word, you know it's true. What did it say? Is it true? It's nice. When you're reading God's word, you don't have to ask, is it true? This is necessary when you're reading books. Is it true? And then finally, how must this affect me? Sometimes there's one answer to that. Sometimes there's a ton. But make sure you ask that. How must this affect me? Next, be discerning. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything Hold fast to what is good. As you look at the theological catastrophes throughout history that derail and destroy churches and souls, especially in the last few hundred years, the destructive influence towards theological liberalism, doctrinal decline, pragmatism, just sinful living, it's, it's sadly most often introduced through seminaries and books. Lenski wrote, the worst forms of wickedness start with perversions of the truth. And oftentimes those perversions are propagated through books. So be careful with theological innovation. Be discerning. Watch the lives and hearts of people who fill themselves with a particular type of knowledge. For, you, you can ask, is this true? Is this supported by God's word? Do that. And then just look at the lives of people who fill themselves with that. Is, is the result of that kind of learning what I want to be? And look at the lives of those who wrote it. Is that a life I want to mimic? Like Hebrews 13, 7, remember your leader, those who spoke the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Read people, read authors whose lives you want to imitate. There's going to be authors that you read whose lives you don't want to imitate. Be aware of that. Oh, what in their thinking led them to have a knowledge that rejected godliness, that rejected God? I need to be careful here. And as you read authors who finished well, this is why it's helpful to read dead authors because you know the outcome of their faith. Okay, what in here helped them persevere to the end? Be aware of high-risk reading. Reading that things that don't hold up or establish the truth of, of God's word. There's sometimes the only authors on a topic or many authors on a topic or, or something that you need to, need to learn is coming from a worldview that is fundamentally anti-God. Okay, I need to be careful here. <laughs> I'm, I'm treading on dangerous ground. I, I might want to learn what this scientist has said, but I must not adopt his worldview. You can read all about the hearing ear and the seeing eye and know everything about it, but not recognize that the Lord made them both and that we ought to worship, right? Nobody, whether they know it, whether they admit it or not, they know, they know God. And they, they reject him when, when they're writing a, a book of science, a book of history, a book of whatever, and they reject the God there. Just make sure that you recognize those um, presuppositions, those heart uh, commitments of an author. Proverbs 17, 24, the discerning sets his face towards wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of an earth are on the ends of the earth. Make sure as you read, you're not saying, oh, this is like, this is the heart of, of the doctrine that's going to keep me close to the Lord. But I, I sort of already know that. I want to go learn about all these random things out there. I want to become so well-read and you're 
knowing a lot about everything but not in that right way. You've probably seen people who do that and you, you've seen the outcome of that. I have, I have many practical examples of why that is just dangerous and foolish to become enraptured, captured by the love of learning many things, but forgetting the main thing, wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord. So as you read, do your homework on authors, identify their worldview, their biases, try to understand why they wrote the book, be discerning, question them. You're going to read a trusted author, have some trusted authors that you know well. Your pastors can help you find those guys that you can generally read the stuff on the book table. You don't read anything undiscerningly, but you can generally read the things on the book table without your radar up. As you go find other things, especially newfangled things, just be careful. Um, have your Bible by your side. Guard your heart. Watch it. Evaluate how what you're reading is affecting your heart. But I have to say, and I'm going to end here, beware of the danger of witch hunting in your reading. There's some that become so enamored with discernment that they read to go find the problem in everything. Oh, this, yeah, that's a good book, but you have to be, be aware of this, 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 and this. And they've skipped over as if it's just understood the part of affecting their own heart and their own life and being changed by it. And they, they see themselves as the, the policemen of good doctrine or the policemen of truth where you see yourself as the judge and arbiter and surround yourself with doctor and, and think it's your job to identify and point out all of, all of the problems. That, that generally leads to pride. You would just do better to saturate your heart and mind with what's true and be aware of what's false. We need to be able to, to help each other, especially the, the pastors, elders of this church. We need to be able to point out truth or point out falsehood and to, uh, protect the sheep from it and to admonish those who, who teach falsehood. We need to be able to all do that. And we need to not be marked by that exclusively. Um, Anti-forgery experts, I think this is true. I've heard the illustration, so I'm just going to use it because it's, it's a good one. They, they don't spend all their time studying a forgery, studying, learning to identify forgeries by studying fake versions because there's going to be an infinite versions of those, of fake money, fake art. But they know very well the real thing so that they can readily identify that which is posing as true but which is actually false. So don't spend your time and your effort going out there to, to read and identify and learn all that's false, all that's untrue, so that you can point it out and help guard others from that. You're going to do much better to saturate your heart with what is true so that you can pursue worshipful godliness that leads to love through knowledge of what's true. That's the last point. Be applicative and then be delighted. If you're doing that, we've already talked about just apply. Don't stop at knowledge. Apply it. And don't view reading as work. It's fun. It, you will have to work hard, but most of the things that are most enjoyable don't come easy. A project that was pretty easy to accomplish probably won't bring you the most joy. The one that you really had to work hard at will bring you the joy and satisfaction. Some reading is easy and fun. Some reading is hard. Do the hard work, but don't forget this is a privilege and a joy. God made you. He made me with minds that have the ability to read, have the ability to take language and put it on a page, get knowledge, be affected by that. Do it and worship God for it. Um, have fun as you read. Instill that in your kids. Instill that in yourself. Also that 
God would be glorified, you would be more holy, and we'd be better equipped to love one another with the knowledge that we have. Let's go out from here. Love the church. Be ready to come back here in 15 minutes and uh, worship God together through song and proclamation of his word.